Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So, we're here today to talk about a project that we've been doing at Glasgow University. Um, unfortunately, Jeremy Singer, who's our lead academic, can't be with us today. So, we're going to do our best to bring out our inner Jeremy. <laughs> so, we're going to talk about adaptive comparative judgment. This is a method of ranking artifacts like student essays, maybe, and making comparative judgments about what is better, what is worse, what you prefer, what you don't prefer, rather than making absolute judgments about this is an A, this is an E. So it's intuitively plausible as a marker. It's an intu intuitively plausible way of how we actually make judgments. And it removes the pretense that we're experts with objective standards when we're marking. Um, controversial. So what this does, what this system of grading does, is it produces a fully ranked set of scripts from best to worst, and it allows for separate consideration about where you put in the grade boundaries. So you don't need to think when you're marking about this is an A, um, this is a first, this is a 2-1, this is a 60, this is a 61. You just think better, worse, better, worse. When you get to the end of the process, then you can decide where you're going to put your grade boundaries and whether you're marking to a curve or whether you're marking to rigid standards. So it accommodates all of these different ways of marking and it frees you up just to make judgments, academic judgments, aesthetic judgments about what's better, what's worse. Um, and from my point of view as a marker, it's a lot easier to mark this way. So, <laughs> doesn't want me to have the next slide not letting me go to the next slide. <laughs> Help. <laughs> See, as soon as he walks onto the stage, it does it. <laughs> oh, you've gone to the wrong after now, Neil. <laughs> Help. <laughs> it's going on. Right, right, that's one, like, next one, please. That one. Okay. So, what it also does is it allows you to judge using a single implicit criterion. Again, what's better or what's worse, rather than trying to use complex, explicit sets of ILOs. Um, it's much easier. And it can be used for... I always used to think it could just be used for questions that only had... that had subjective, different answers. But actually, you can use it for questions that have a single correct answer as well. All of this is stage scene setting. It will become a lot clearer once Neil starts talking, I hope. Okay, so distinctive benefits before Neil starts. It scales, you can use it for tiny sets of um, submissions like 20 or up to 10,000. Potential for use in MOOCs I think is fantastic and indeed Jeremy's been using it in his MOOC. Um, it says compelling naturalness, it is intuitively plausible. It can be used with one marker, it can be used with sets of markers, so you can get your inter and intra rater reliability. It can be used for peer review, which is how we've been using it. So you crowdsource, you get the students to do all of the judgments, and then as an academic, you come in and award the marks. So it saves a lot of time. Um, it can be used to mark things that are very, very different from each other because you're just judging better, worse, rather than a set of ILOs. Um, and you can also put in exemplars. So if you, really, if you want to say, um, I want to see which are, where my grade boundaries are, you put in the exemplar for the A, B, C, D, E. Anything that was at the A or above would get the A, um, so forth. And I think I'm handing over to you now. Oh, okay, I'll talk to you this time. Um, okay, so we've, we've, um, we've used the software at Glasgow. We're using it in the Haskell MOOC. We've used it to judge our conference submissions, because when conference submissions come in, they're very, very different. But we were able to rank them to best fit to the conference and then decide which are the ones we were going to put in each of the streams. Um, there was a major experiment done of this adaptive comparative judgment which Pollitt talks about in 2012. Um, and what Pollitt found was that expert markers um, who were highly skeptical initially of using this process, but by the end of it, they judged that this process was a better way of marking and it was a faster way of marking. 
So faster is always good. As academics, if we can do our marking faster, that's always great. But we also want to do, know that we're marking and keeping our academic standards. And it found that it kept the academic standards. Indeed, I think it outperforms regular ways of marking. This is so you. our implementation. We've uh, Paul had used uh, his own implementation of one day apps at Cambridge. We've done our own very lightweight impl implementation. It's a simple LTI application, so it doesn't have to deal with user stuff. That's all done by the LMS. We use it with Moodle, or have used it with Moodle a bit in experiments. The study we're reporting on here, we used it with FutureLearn, which allows you to launch separate LTI tools. Um, our tool lets the submissions be text, PDFs, a YouTube URL, a picture, things like that. In this instance, it was source code, and the students just paste in text, and then a standard source code, code formatter makes it pretty printed and nicely colored to make it easier to read. Um, you could also ha add students by, uh, uh, the software allows staff to put in a set of things for students to review, to make it a reviewing only exercise, a sort of learning to judge from the student's viewpoint. Um, and like other tools, Moodle Workshop, many of you will be familiar with, Aropa is a similar tool we use at Glasgow University and I think a few other universities use. Um, it's got a phase for submission and then a phase for review. We are thinking a bit about getting that bl more blurred in future. So the, the process, the algorithm, it's a rounds of sorting. So in each round, the people doing the marking or the grading just look at two things at a time and decide which is better. And each artifact, each piece of work will be judged at least once and probably not much more than once, depending on random things about who turns up when people are looking at things. Um, these rounds are put into three slightly different phases, which I'll talk more about in a minute, but they have slightly different scoring algorithms to improve the quality of the sorting. And uh, uh, this algorithm, it's a bit different from Pollitt's. Pollitt's algorithm is problematic because in his paper there's a typo and you can't quite work out what the algorithm is. So uh, I developed my own based more on his description than his maths and um, used a simulation to refine the, uh, this algorithm. I'll be showing you some output from that simulation. So just, this is sort of helping you think about it, but also understand the next few slides which show output from my simulation. So you start off with your artifacts, your pieces of student work. Uh, here are six examples. They're just in a random order, numbered in order, so you can see what they are, but this is just would be the order in which the students had submitted, probably. To make the things easier to view in my simulation, I color coded. Darker means more to the left in this sorting. Lighter should go more to the right. Um, so in the simulation, these colors are effectively assigned to be the perfect score, and then a random number was added or removed to that so that it's got the slight error of reality. So in each round, each thing's compared, the one more to the right is picked and given a point. So, and then a first sort, all the ones that got one point are on the right, all the ones that got zero points are on the left. So get on to the next round. And again, the better one, or the one judged better, gets an extra point. And now some have two points, go further strike. Some have one point in the middle. Some have zero points. This sort of sorting over a long, long period would get it right, but that's not quite enough. But and so there is a sort of scoring algorithm put in there so that as it, the first two, two or three rounds are just done that simple way, but later on it starts weighting the comparisons depending on how far away in the sort are. 
So in the second phase, it's weighted to allow things to move quite fast, because if randomly a few really good or really bad bits of work had been put together at the very beginning in the first random order, one of them could have ended up very out of place. And then later, it goes to a much more refined sorting things close together algorithm. So here you're seeing the first four rounds of a simulated one following one particular thing, number 43 highlighted in orange down as it sorts, and the red highlights are the ones it has been compared against. And so its score at this level relates to where these are in the previous sort level. And with a few more, this is then using the more refined algorithm. And as you can see, the sort of grayishness goes very smoothly, almost from dark to light across, showing, showing that this is actually a quite effective sorting mechanism. After about 18 rounds of sorting, it's near enough perfect. And this scales. This would work however many artifacts were in there because it's comparing with a, a sample and using their positions. So here it is, the same with, this is just the middle third of a thing. All you can see, of course, is the color, but as you can see, it's quite smooth towards the bottom from being quite random towards the top. So that's with 600. I've experimented with up to 1,000 on the little server I was experimenting on. That's getting to its beginning to run a bit slow. So you can try this out. Am I doing for time? Um, you have ten minutes. Ah. Um, if you have your mobile device handy, you can log into our wee demo site. This is my first ever trial. I just keep running to show off, and I put up some pictures for people to sort. It did show up some interesting things. These are pictures of wildlife, flowers, insects, birds. They're not very good pictures, they're just ones I found on my camera. But it was noticeable some people do sort. Looking at this type of artifact, which has got different categories, you could wait, look at it. So some people would sort to make a robin very good, even though it's not a great picture, but it's a nice bird. And other people would say, spider goes right down, even though it's quite a good picture. Um, so there's, you did notice there's two artifacts, and that's my, the two aspects, at least, to the way people judge. And this might um, mean you need a bit more guidance, but that's these pictures. Maybe in academic work, it's going to be a bit better. So our case study, functional programming in Haskell. This is an interesting course in that it's run as the first half of an honors module but also as a MOOC. So about 1,000 people in this particular run were using it from around the world on Future Learn, and a class of about 80 honours students at the University of Glasgow. It's a, as a programming language, Haskell, it was developed at Glasgow, so that's a good thing for us. But it's, from our students' viewpoint, it's a slight paradigm shift in their way of programming, so it's an, a quite new language to them. Previously, they've programmed in very conventional languages like Python and Java, and then they do this Haskell, which is a functional programming language and quite different style in honors. They were given a problem specification to implement, something which could be done in about a page of code. Some guidelines as how to judge so some criteria about, you know, look at readability, look at act, uh, actually solving the problem. And then in the marking phase, this grading phase, they were looked at their peers' solutions to compare. So in this instance, it was a, we we're using this as a peer tool. And then finally, at the end, they'll see their own ranking just as a what quartile it got into. We don't want to say to people, you are worst. But we do say you were in the bottom group. And I'm sure they will all have known this by having seen the others. Um, and they also got given a sample solution. So this is the question. Write a spell book generator. It's the sort of thing that Haskell's a good language for doing. Um, and they were given these 
instructions about how to write the good quality code. And then here's a sample solution. As you can see, it's a quite concise language. Um, and this is... So, student comments, I'll hand back to Sarah. Okay. So, we did some evaluation, of course we did. We like to evaluate it. Um, we sent out an online survey to all of the students, including the um, ones from the MOOC and our honours students, and we asked them a range of questions um, about what they thought about the ACJ software, because they're computing students, so we wanted those sort of answers from them, evaluation, and also what they thought about the process. Um, so these were students who were probably fairly new to doing peer review anyway, and it was peer review using ACJs. We asked of a range of questions. Um, and what we got was a lot of students telling us that they liked the way that they got to see lots and lots and lots of different solutions. Because typically in peer review, you'd see two or three maybe, but with this, they could see a lot. And the ones that were really invested, of course, could just do more. We weren't limiting them. So it's, it can be quite addictive. Um, when, we, when we first used it for the conference, it was me and Kathy Bovel. We just got really, really addicted to actually doing the reviewing. So we did masses, because we just loved seeing these photos. Um, and we loved seeing the abstracts and all of that. It was great. Anyway, um, again, here's one. They said they thought doing this helped them to think differently because they're having to think how to evaluate their um, peers' code. Um, here, this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to show students early on what their position was in the class without having a leaderboard, and they could see how well or how poorly they were doing for themselves. Instant feedback, early feedback, really important. Um, and again, I love this one. I'd like to thank the course educators as well. I think that's thanks to Jeremy, not to us, but we'll take it. Um, and again, this, like, I thought this was really interesting, that as time went on, they could see that they got quicker at doing it. Um, so yes, the, the process speeds up, and it's one more. So how could we use it? Some interesting stats. Well, we can get some interesting reports out of it if we wanted to write them. So we could set the software up to say, who was the most deviant marker? So, you know, sometimes you have a marker who's a bit problematic. Everybody else maybe is judging something to be good, and they're judging it to be really bad. Well, you might want to look at this marker and take them out, or you might want to look at this marker and say, what is this marker seeing that everybody else is missing? So you can get that sort of information out of it. You can also see which submission was the most divisive, which was the Marmite submission, the one that some... Marcus thought was brilliant, some Marcus didn't think was brilliant. Again, is it the case, who's missing what? Because, you know, I know myself, sometimes I've marked something and I think it's round, maybe round about a C, and then somebody else comes in and says, actually, do you know what? There's something really novel, really interesting. I would give that an A. These are the conversations that we have as markers, and these are conversations that we can see in the software. And again, we can see how converged the judgments are. Is it the case that everybody thinks that one is the best, that one is the worst, or is there a bit of a controversy? And so it's not the case that we're just given a bit of ranking and we have to accept it. We can interrogate the data. Um, so where next? Well, the software we have is still in development. It's still a pilot tool. We've been piloting it successfully for how many years now? Three, four, three, four years? in small things. Um, it's living software. Neil is the developer. Um, Neil's a fantastic developer to work with because he understands what academics want and he will work with academics to get a bit of software that works for them. So if there's a restriction in the software, very often Neil will work to get around that restriction. You know, obviously there are restrictions like you just can't do, you can't do magic. He can't give you a unicorn. But he has developed this bit of software in line with academics and working with Jeremy, um, who is a fantastic academic, um, who's very engaged in his teaching and indeed is very engaging when he teaches, um, is really, really useful because you get a bit of software that is suited for academics, but it's technologically robust as well. Um, 
And I think at this stage, if, if you think it would be useful in your teaching, I think Neil is putting out a call to ask for collaboration. The software, of course, is open source. It's on GitHub. Anybody can go and pick it up. But what we'd like is if people are picking it up, if they'd work with us, because we're, get, we're doing further research in this. We're still using it. We're trying to extend our pilots. And what we would really like is to work across the academic community to work with you to do a proper, robust study. Um, so scholarship research, or people who just think, yes, I want this in my teaching. I don't want to do any scholarship. No research. Please just let me use it. All of these are fine. Um, and I think that's it. Fantastic. Um, there, are, there is a roving mic, so if you'd like to raise your hand and um, ask a question. We have had a few questions here as well. So one of them was around providing feedback to students. And um, the question was, if a submission is ranked at or near the bottom of the rankings, how does the process provide feedback so that the students know what needs improving or why they got a low score? So we'll start with that. Um, but if you have a question in the room, we'll come to you next. Yeah. So there is no traditional feedback given. So no saying, you should have done this. This bit was poor. I've been a student recently enough to remember that wasn't very helpful. What there is, is what David Dickel would consider to be internalizing of feedback. The students are seeing a range of work. There's a very good learning potential there. It probably needs to be studied more, but I think that's a, that is potentially a much more useful form of feedback. That's an interesting new solution. Um, if you do have a question, can you just let us know who you are and where you're from? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve Rowett from UCL. Um, it's a bit like a binary sort algorithm, I guess. Yes. And by the end of that, a student is comparing two things that are probably very similar. Yes. You know, they're, they're near the bottom end, they're near the top end, yeah. they're, they're in the middle. Does that make it very difficult? Because it's quite hard comparing two things that are similar, right? It probably does make the, the, the comparison harder at the end. And yet, ideally, we'd get students going through from the beginning to end, but you can't unless you've somehow got them timed into it. Um, and since we're doing this fairly open, like they log in and they're on time, we can't do that. So that, that's something worth looking at and thinking about how to make it better from that viewpoint. Um, but yeah, when doing the, the conference judging, which I took part in, yes, things get slightly harder at the end, but you also, because of being through it, you, you get quick, you get good at it. Um, if you're just jumping in at the end, yes, I can see there's an issue. But I think at that point, really, at that point, you just say, well, we've got the sort, no more judging to be done. Yeah. And if students needed, if it, if it was a peer exercise, you would, we could, we've talked about starting it again for students to go through the process. So we could have multiple sets. Oh. And, then, and then we, fantastic, then we could rank all of those against each other. Wow, what, a, what well, an evaluation yeah. nightmare. Well, one thing, if a student is seeing two very close together, the next pair they see will also be close together, but they won't be close to these two. They'll have been, it's quite different in the sorting. Thank you. I think we've got time for two more questions, so we'll take one online, and then if there's any more in the room, if you just hold your hand up, please, um, and we'll come to you for the last question. So there were a couple of questions around algorithms, and there was also a question around the ease of use and whether it's openly licensed. So maybe if we focus on ease of use and openly I'll licensed. Do, I'll do ease of use. Um, it's incredibly easy to use. I have been using Moodle Workshop for many, many years. I understand its affordances. Um, it's not the easiest. It's a lot easier um, to set up because there aren't as many settings in it. So from the point of view of a member of staff setting up, it's very easy. From the point of view of a student, it's really, really easy. They get two things on screen and they just sit, they either push left or push right. That's, that's it. And in terms of licensing, Apache 2 license. Um, there's a few bits of other open source in there which have various different licenses, but they're all quite liberal open source ones. Great, thank you. So time for our last question. Is there, is there anyone in the room or have you all posted them online? 
Otherwise, I think we'll finish with a question around the algorithm. And um, so we have a couple of questions. One is how sensitive is the algorithm? One is, is the algorithm just rules? And the last one, is it ethical to use an algorithm without checking the results? Or are you checking the results? And um, could you expand a little bit on that? So if we maybe round up on that, um, is that all right? Well, the algorithm is just rules, yes. That's what an <laughs> algorithm is. It say, says, given this, we will award this number and use that in a sort. Um, <laughs> the checking, well, the simulation shows it works. Yeah. The simulation shows very convincingly it works with a lot of noise in it, which is interesting. That's where this algorithm is different from a standard computing binary sort because there's, it deals with noise. It deals with some of the judgments being different from others. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, we also want to give a big shout out if you have been watching this online. I think there are some colleagues from Sarah and Neil who might be watching <laughs> this on the live stream. So if you have been joining us online, a very warm welcome to you as well. If you could just put your hands together for our presenters. Thank you. Adina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.